Uh, this is the uh, first uh, of a two-part lecture on pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Uh, the first part will deal primarily with pharmacokinetics and the second podcast uh, dynamics. Uh, uh, each will only be about 20 to 25 minutes long. The objectives of this first part are to understand pharmacokinetics in the following terms. <laughs> Absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion list characteristics of both unionized and ionized forms of drugs uh, and why that distinction is portent, important, uh, define volume of distribution and clearance and how they relate to half-life, and then understand plasma decay curves uh, in two and three compartment models. Uh, so pharmacokinetics, along with pharmacodynamics, describes drugs and uh, in a way that helps us understand how uh, they act in the body or what the body actually does to the drug. Pharmacokinetics is typically um, listed that way as what the body does to the drug, while pharmacodynamics is um, frequently referred to as what the drug does in or to the body. And understanding these pharmacokinetics will help us better develop uh, drugs that are more useful for us in anesthesia, uh, particularly uh, with the development of some of these computer-driven infusion pumps uh, and, and further developments in, in the pain field of, of patient-controlled analgesia and, and, and those sorts of um, um, uh, clinical devices. Absorption is the process by which a drug leaves the site of administration to enter the bloodstream. If we take that uh, definition, it f naturally follows then that drugs administered intravenously have no absorption because they're immediately put into the bloodstream. Uh, the Absorption is affected by both drug solubility, pKa, concentration, and the site of absorption. Um, recognize that things like um, shock may decrease uh, a drug's absorption or even their bioavailability, where something like heat, where uh, the vessels vasodilate, would probably improve a drug's absorption and bioavailability. Bioavailability listed there is that fraction of total dose that reaches the systemic circulation and the rate at which that occurs. Um, and therefore, that differs a bit from absorption. Uh, we know that drugs that are very lipophilic are highly bioavailable when they are taken orally. A drug like uh, Valium or Diazepam is. Uh, nearly 90% bioavailable when taken uh, orally, uh, such that you will re achieve uh, a plasma level uh, at or around 90% equivalent to that same dose if given uh, intravenously. On the other hand, a drug like nitroglycerin is much less bioavailable uh, when given orally uh, because it is absorbed um, and passes into the portal system directly to the liver and is metabolized. Uh, in this first pass, hepatic metabolism uh, limits its uh, blood concentration and bioavailability to uh, its effective site. Uh, one way to bypass this is to give the nitroglycerin, as you all are aware, sublingually uh, and, and and by doing so, you bypass this first pass hepatic metabolism. <clears throat> it's important for you to recognize uh, in this table from one of the uh, Basics of Anesthesia text uh, editions by Stolting that we are primarily interested in drugs um, that are non-ionized uh, receptors are lipophilic and that it's the non-ionized species that needs to uh, provide uh, an active effect from the drug. Uh, it, these non-INA species can, of course, cross lipid membranes and get to the effective site. They would not be renally excre excreted, but could undergo hepatic uh, metabolism. 
Again, another example of this would be diazepam, which is lipophilic, one pressure, call one two oh four, please. One two, one two oh four. which will cross uh, membranes to the site of action or to be metabolized in the liver, but does not readily undergo renal excretion. Unlike non-depolarizing muscle relaxants, which are much more hydrophilic and will undergo uh, renal excretion. Um, let's look and see how um, the uh, acid base status and its effect on the drug will affect the action of that drug in the body. Remember that the pK is, is the pH at which 50% of the drug is ionized and 50% unionized. When you have a weak base, you have uh, a molecule attached to that drug, which is ammonia in equilibrium with the um, charged ammonium ion. If that particular weak base is in a acidic environment, the ionized species would predominate, and that would make less of the drug active. Think for a minute about local anesthetics, which are weak bases. One of the theories behind their um, inability to work after you say you lose a block and then you try to reduce, re resume that block, say in an epidural, is that a local acidosis may occur at that site, which keeps this weak base in its charged ammonium form and unable to cross uh, the membrane to block sodium channels and give you the block that you want. Uh, on the other hand, in an alkalotic environment, uh, drugs like weak bases and uh, drugs like local anesthetics and opioids, which again are weak bases, would um, have an active form. <clears throat> Let's compare that to weak acids, uh, one that was used some years ago and is still used as a model for pharmacokinetic modeling are the barbiturates. Sodium thiopental, STP, um, is a weak acid. And here things are a little bit different. The reactive species attached to this molecule is a carboxyl group or carboxylic acid. The carboxyl group is the charged species. Carboxylic acid is the non-ionized, unionized <coughs> active species, if you will. So uh, unlike with a weak base, in an acidic environment with a, in a weak acid, the unionized species predominates, uh, whereas in an alkalotic environment, um, the ionized species would predominate. This might be important or should be important for say our emergency room colleagues uh, when in treating say a barbiturate um, uh, overdose they could alkalinize the patient by giving sodium bicarbonate to increase the pH which increases the ionized species of the drug they're trying to eliminate from the body to encourage renal excretion. <coughs> uh, distribution um, occurs after absorption and is a major determinant of end organ drug concentrations. There are several phases of distribution. It's certainly affected by the perfusion to the various organs. Um, uh, both vessel-rich muscle group and less to a lesser extent fat and bone, uh, which we'll show in the next slide, their particular distribution and blood flow. And then protein binding. Um, many drugs are bound to proteins in the body. Typically, albumin binds acidic drugs, and alpha acid glycoprotein binds basic drugs. And a drug that is bound to protein is inactive and unable to bind to its receptor to uh, cause an effect. Uh, keep in mind that uh, a number of things such as significant systemic liver kidney disease or nutritional status uh, can affect the level of these proteins in the body thereby uh, allowing a higher free fraction of drug uh, to have a, a, an exaggerated effect in, in some of those disease states. 
<clears throat> Another table out of one, uh, Stolting's uh, Basics of Anesthesia. Uh, the, um, keep in mind that by far and away the drugs that we give, particularly in anesthesia, um, have their effects and early distribution to what amounts to 75% of blood flow from 75% uh, from of the cardiac output uh, to organs like the liver, kidney, brain, lungs, and heart. Um, after a period of time, minutes, maybe maximum hours, the, these drugs uh, redistribute to muscle groups and then ultimately after days, in some instances, onto fat and then the vessel pore group such as bone which receives uh, one or less than one percent of cardiac output. <clears throat> Volume of distribution, uh, keep in mind that this is a, um, it, it quantifies the extent of drug distribution uh, but it is an apparent volume uh, into which a drug distributes and allows mathematical modeling of particular drugs to see how they behave uh, in the body, particularly as it relates to their clearance and half-life. Uh, if you recall, half-life is the time uh, that it takes the drug's concentration to be reduced by uh, one half after it, uh, as it's processed in the body. Um, so going back to volume of distribution, remember that it's a, an apparent volume that allows us to make these uh, pharmacokinetic descriptions. Uh, so for example, drugs that are very lipophilic, uh, like our previous example, diazepam, uh, will have a very, very high volume of distribution, one in fact that exceeds the total volume in the body, uh, something in the order of um, uh, 12 to 1400 liters. Uh, but again, it's not the absolute volume, it's, it's a value that allows us to, to mathematically describe how that drug will react uh, in terms of its half-life in the body. Clearance is the volume of blood completely cleared per unit of time, and we'll see in a later formula how these two uh, characteristics combine in a formula uh, to help us understand half-life. How does one calculate volume of distribution? Uh, you give a drug intravenously to the body, and then you begin to sample serum concentrations and measure those. And we've plotted four samples over time and then draw a best fit line. Now the formula requires us to have the concentration at time zero. So it's the, the volume of distribution is the amount of drug given divided by the concentration at time zero. The concentration at time zero is calculated simply by extrapolating back uh, to, to, to um, the zero time and looking at that concentration. Uh, and, and, and in that way, you're able to calculate a volume of distribution. So it's the vo this volume of distribution is used in compartmental pharmacokinetic models. It describes the distribution into these boxes, into these compartments, and uh, they again permit analysis of drug distribution and elimination uh, over time. It's affected by many things, including protein size, uh, drug protein binding, drug size, lipid solubility, uh, and various disease states and physiologic states. <clears throat> Let's look at some of these models. This comes out of Miller's uh, sixth edition. In a simple one compartment model of, for, of which very few drugs, if any, actually exist, the drug is administered distributes in a volume, and then undergoes elimination from that compartment via an elimination rate constant described here as K. Um, 
more often than not, drugs follow either a two or even three compartment model. Sometimes these peripheral compartments are uh, also referred to as um, deep or shallow compartments. Shallow being one that uh, fills perhaps a bit more quickly, whereas a deep compartment uh, has a higher volume of distribution. But these peripheral compartments undergo um, e equilibration with the central compartment over time. And actually, from these peripheral compartments, you will also have elimination um, from the, the both, both compartments. <coughs> the elimination rate constant here is described, again, as, um, as uh, down, down in this area. Uh, also recognize that these elimination rates, rate constants undergo first-order kinetics, which means a certain fraction of the drug is eliminated per unit time. And that's uh, an important distinction from zero-order kinetics, where a certain amount of drug is eliminated per unit time. Uh, first-order kinetics allows uh, mathematical modeling uh, that's described on this slide so that one can on a, plot out the plasma decay of a, a drug that's administered on a log linear scale uh, that in many cases will follow a tri-exponential uh, decay so that you'll see um, three distinct curves. One that's distribution of the drug, the second redistribution, and the third elimination that you might see uh, with hepatic metabolism. <clears throat> Keep in mind that as anesthesiologists, we are typically working on the far left-hand part of this curve, looking at distribution and redistribution. If we waited uh, and redosed our drugs based on the uh, hepatic elimination half-life, uh, most of our patients would um, not be properly anesthetized. Here is that tri-exponential decay curve um, showing a rapid decline and then a elbow, if you will, which is a redistribution from this distribution phase and then elimination over a much longer period of time. On each of these three curves, one, two, three, we can draw a best fit line. Um, ignore for a minute the mathematical modeling and just realize that these lines help us determine, perhaps most importantly, the half-life for that particular phase. And again, since we're working over here, our ha anesthesiologists are working over here in distribution and redistribution, our half-lives are much, much quicker than this um, slowly decaying elimination half-life curve that our colleagues, say, for example, in the internal medicine field might use in patients that they're treating for hypertension where they're giving a medicine once a day or once, uh, maybe twice a day. Um, if we look, for example, on the half-life of the redistribution phase, and you need to spend a little bit of time looking at this, this is a logarithmic scale. If we look at a unit of four on the concentration and draw a straight line over and then straight down, uh, we can see that that is maybe around 15 to 20 uh, minutes if we drop that concentration by half from 4 to 2 and draw a line over, we see that that uh, line may be around 35 to 40. 40 minus 20 is approximately 20 minutes. So the half-life of the redistribution phase um, in this particular drug modeling is approximately 20 minutes. Here is the final formula for this uh, podcast, um, and this relates clearance to volume of distribution and, and half-life. The volume of drug completely cleared 
the volume of blood completely cleared of drug per unit time is the clearance as we recall um, this is a mathematical formula 0 0.693 times the volume of distribution is directly uh, proportional to the clearance but inversely proportional to the half-life um, so again if you have a drug like diazepam which we said had a very very high uh, volume of distribution it would follow from this formula that it would have a very, very high half-life. On the other hand, midazolam, for example, has a lower volume of distribution, so its half-life is, is shorter. So again, clearance directly proportional to volume of distribution and inversely proportional to half-life. Of course, clearance is, is expressed in millimeters um, per minute. So think about this formula and how it affects um, the characteristics and the behavior of the drugs we administer in anesthesia. That concludes the uh, first podcast for Basics of Pharmacokinetics and Pharmacodynamics.